I wanted to start recording early because Brenda is here. She said she wouldn't miss this, but she was going crunch, crunch, crunch. She said Captain Crunch like cereal. And it's either your nephews like Captain Crunch, but or it's something like you had something crunchy and then there's a problem with chewing crunchies with you. Well, <laughs> this is what I think it is. Okay. I was, um, you know, my sister has this little business where she has started selling things and I'm helping her because that's what I used to do. And I think I just took pictures for her of uh, Rice Krispies and oh. it says crunch, crunch, crunch all over the bowl and the cup. You're <laughs> kidding me. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. This is exactly what she said. Crunch, crunch. Uh, <laughs> yay. <Brenda. laughs> yeah. Well, hi, everybody. We are so happy to come together here to share with you answers to questions that came up in my last monthly mentoring session when we didn't have enough time to answer all of them. The subject, the main subject at that time was the soul, the higher self, and our human self. But a lot of questions came up because we really dove into some deep subjects. So I thought it'd be fun to get my two wonderful team members here together to ask questions and I'll ask them of Sanaya as we go along if I can't answer them myself. And this is totally spontaneous. I didn't want to see any of the questions in advance. So we have here my two wonderful friends and assistants, Bev Garlip. Many of you are familiar with Bev because you've emailed her for help with things. <laughs> yeah. um, and Lynette Setscorn, I couldn't ask for two better helpers on this journey. Could not do this work without them. And we just love each other and hopefully you feel that love coming at you too because we just love this whole community. So I'm gonna go switch here into speaker view and We'll just dive right in. And Bev, you can start by just saying hi to everybody and then go with the first question, all right? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, as those of you who were at the mentoring session know, we had about 75 questions. So we have a long list. We may not get to all of them, but we'll start down the list. Um, I have a question from uh, Monique. And she said, how do we know the difference between our imagination and what might feel real when something happens that we wonder could be a message? I frequently want to believe something so badly that I think I might be imagining the event as being a message when it's probably just a coincidence. Such a great question, and it's a very common one. I'm going to try to answer all the questions so that they apply to all of you listening. We often can't tell the difference between our imagination and what comes from spirit. So it's a matter of working with your guides with a strong intention that the answers come from a place beyond our human awareness. And then you give them the heart test, first of all. Is it hopeful, helpful, and healing? And if so, then you can act on it. So in that case, does it matter if it's your imagination? When we understand there's only one mind, it doesn't really matter. But you can also give it the sign test and ask your team in spirit, if I'm to trust this, I'd like a specific sign in the coming days. And then you ask for that sign and keep a lookout for it. Just keep doing this process over and over and you get to the point where you can actually discern this is higher guidance. Thanks. Thank you. Over to you, Lynette. This is a perfect tie into that last question. This is from Barbara. Suzanne, I've tried asking for a specific sign to confirm something I know is true, just to see if I can get a sign. Mostly, I don't. Is it possible some of us are on the wrong frequency? Is there a vibrational component to why some communicate and some don't? There is a vibrational component to everything. And there are times when we're not meant to get a sign. There are other times when we're just not yet as present or aware with what is in our environment that we notice the signs. I remember one time asking my guide for a sign of a, a Russian Cossack hat. And about three days later I said, well, I didn't get my sign. And my guide said, I gave it to you. And I said, what? 
And then he showed me that I had just seen it when going through the pictures on my phone. And I went back and there it was, it just went right by me. So there are a number of reasons and you can ramp up your intention to be more aware uh, and always just keep working on your own vibration that you become more present, more open, and just enjoy the process. That's good. All right. Thank you. All right, ready. Uh, this one is from Rebecca. And again, it's, it's one I'm sure is on the minds of, of many listeners. I've been feeling so sad about the environment. It's been going on for a while. How can I see the perfection in everything while being aware of global warming, climate change, and so forth? I do surround myself with nature and I do my best to commune with it, but I still feel sad. It's a lovely sentiment to have compassion for the earth. I can feel that. And our guides are assuring us now that our earth is far more resilient than we're aware. I'm hearing that she seeks balance herself in spite of the inhabitants who are doing their best to not <laughs> seek balance. The thing is that's lovely as our consciousness rises and we entrain with the vibration of our earth, more and more we'll get back to a place of respect of nature that our ancestors had. So do continue with your concern, but they tell us to make sure that it's not fear. There's a big difference in vibration level between worry and fear and, and knowing all is well and I'm going to do what part I can to raise the collective consciousness of humanity so that we shift our awareness to what is truly important. And that's not ourselves, but the wholeness of humanity and the earth, our host. Okay, that was nice. I can really tell these answers are coming from the team. And that's just... I'm wow, that's really... That was comforting. <laughs> so our next question is from Garner. I hear people talking about love, love, love. I do not feel I am part of that aspect of love. I can't feel it like others talk about it. Can you share how the best way to receive and experience this love everyone talks about? Yes, and as I hear that question, my heart just opens to all of you who may be in that situation. This is conditioning. This is absolutely a result of being humanized by those around you who are not aware of who we are, which is the expression, the extension of love itself. Right now, the best tool I have to offer you is a meditation that's on my website called uh, Journey of Consciousness. It's on the free meditations gift page. That and Journey of Remembrance. The Journey of Remembrance is a guided uh, experience. The words and the vibration and the music ignite something in your soul that reminds us that we are souls. The Journey of Consciousness gives you an actual tool to visualize yourself before all of the layers of the story of you piled up in your awareness and blinded you to the love that is right here within you now. So it takes the understanding, the belief that love is right here. It's not something we get outside of ourselves and then setting the intention to open our awareness to that and to be able to feel that which our own conditioning has hidden us from. It doesn't do any good to blame it on others or to look at how other people are affecting us, just know I'm ready to peel back the layers that are blinding me from what's already here. Great. Um, I know Sanaya has answered this before, but it's also on the minds of so many people. Does a soul come to earth by choice and do we choose our family? Absolutely, yes and yes. Over and over, those across the veil who come to those of us who ask for evidence with evidence that we are truly connecting to higher consciousness tell us that we make a plan for our lives before we come here and there are certain traits characteristics issues that the soul wants to work on not because it has to but because it helps it to to experience the fullness the wholeness of what life with a capital l has to offer us and so we we look and we see 
what other souls are now incarnated who are looking to create a child, have that experience? And what do they bring to the table that would give this soul the experience by being part of that family? And usually they're already part of our family of souls to begin with. So it is a deliberate choice to have certain parents to go into a body with certain makeup strictly for the experience. And the experience is ultimately to return back to a soul with a higher vibration with more love and wholeness than we entered into the incarnation. So when you look at life that way, even our challenges are opportunities. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is a big one. <laughs> this is a long question. This is from Emily. If we are truly creating our reality, why is it that many of our worst nightmares that have the most impact on our lives are created by other people? Well, there I need so to stop right there, Lynette. I can only handle when I'm tuning into the guides so much at a time, and that one right there has enough of an answer in okay. it. There's right. a big belief in the uh, new thought movement now that we can change our whole reality simply with our thoughts. We can certainly change our experience of reality with our thoughts by focusing on, by choosing a higher perspective as a soul. So we can see things from our human story and that often leads to suffering or we can rise above and as a soul say, I can see the different perspectives playing into this. But because we're part of a collective consciousness, nested realities, greater and greater perspectives, we don't have control at the human level of everything. And that's very clear. There are so many souls interacting, all of us growing from this interaction. So many other forces, even planetary vibrations, it's mind boggling when you think of what goes into reality now. That to think that one person can create everything they want from the human viewpoint is not really realistic. But we can certainly create our own peace in any moment and then through focus through working with the laws of nature we can create as much of reality as we're capable of but the greatest intention we can set is may the greatest good be achieved through these thoughts so is there a second part to that Lynette there he is <laughs> there is if we designed our own destiny on a soul level, does it make sense that so many people and animals have created the life of misery, poverty, like factory farm animals, people who have lived and worked in terrible conditions and the like? So the soul does not come in here deliberately to suffer, but in accordance with that previous question, the soul certainly knows the kind of situation it's going to get into. It may choose a country in which it's known that there is more poverty than in most. It may choose a culture or a race that it knows has been perhaps not treated equally throughout history. And it does this willingly knowing that these offer some of the greatest opportunities, but also the greatest challenges. So the, the soul's intention in coming in here, here is to raise the vibration whether or not that happens in that lifetime again comes back to all of these players interacting but the soul comes here knowing that it has the opportunity to raise the love what happens is the souls get so conditioned by others around them who believe they are only the story that it's very easy to act only on the human nature forget the soul nature and that perpetuates some of the barbarianism that we see around us. So the more all of us work at awakening to our true nature, choose the higher soul's point of view, we will see more progress and less of the tragedies that we see so often. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mayun asks, uh, my father was murdered 24 years ago. Do those whose lives are taken by the hand of another transition differently? Do they have a choice with that exit point? All right, let's first talk about exit points. 
from what I've witnessed so far, I've seen mostly choice, but I'm hearing right now that often there is a higher perspective where the higher beings know that someone's exit would cause enough of a benefit by that soul leaving the body at that time that, let me ask here, that it's, you would understand choice in human terms, but at the soul level, it's not even a choice. It is so obvious that this is the route to go for the greater good. The soul understands this. So we certainly feel compassion for any family who has gone through that at the human level. What was the first part of that question again? Do those whose lives are taken by the hand of another transition yeah. differently? Do they transition differently? They're, I'm being shown each person, each transition is slightly different for exactly what the soul needs. But I'm shown that all are immediately surrounded by love. And in fact, I see a joyous reunion with many, even those who were murdered, whose lives were, human lives were taken by another. They're just met with an uplifting, everything is fine feeling is what I'm being shown. If we, if we all just understood this, it's certainly a tragedy for those of us left behind, but if we could only experience what our loved ones experience and the, the greeting, the reunion that the soul experiences upon transitioning, it would bring so much peace to so many. Very comforting. Thank you. Yeah, I love that one. I got to interrupt there a second, Lynette, sorry, but you know, this sounds like Pollyanna and that I'm just trying to comfort people, but this is from experience, truly from connecting with thousands of souls who have passed. I haven't found a single one who hasn't talked about being met by love. It didn't matter the way they passed. The only thing I can think of recently is someone who was the murderer. They were met by love, but cocooned in a way that they were not allowed to interact with others until that, that pattern of energy that was their persona was deconditioned. So that's a whole other subject. But even so, that cocoon soul was still allowed to know there is love in this world. That's great. So this is sort of an adjunct to it. And oh my goodness, I just asked this question. <laughs> so it's from Lynette, because I hear this a lot in doing your scheduling. Do our loved ones on the other side wish for justice or want to see those who victimize them punished? Oh, I can only speak. <laughs> I was gonna say, I can only speak from experience. And the guides just said, we can speak to this, <laughs> which is what we want. Okay. Justice is a human term, is what the spirits are saying. There is one leveler, and that is love, one equalizer, and that is love. And when one crosses the veil and is so imbued with this awareness that love is the very essence of all that is, all thoughts of retribution and justice dissipate like the wispy dream of separation that you are experiencing. Wow. Nice. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Ready for the next one. Okay. Uh, actually, the same question was asked by Rebecca and Dawn. Do you ever get a spirit that the sitter doesn't recognize, but they have a strong message for the sitter or someone the sitter knows? That happens occasionally, and that's why as a medium, and for any of you who are training to be mediums, when you get a few things, at first, baby mediums are quick to say, well, I must be wrong, or well, let's move on, because it's very uncomfortable to have a sitter say, no, I don't know who that is. No, nope, that doesn't resonate with me at all. So that's why it's so important to feel the presence of that spirit who's here, ask them for evidence, and just get a little more evidence and then say, why are you here? To make sure we get the message that they came with. And you deliver the message, and if it still doesn't make sense, you just plant that seed in your sitter's mind. Well, you ask a few people, perhaps share this with your partner, because it, it, I'm not discerning correctly who this is, but I know this is a message that needs to be delivered. Great. 
Lynette. Yes. This is uh, from an anonymous attendee. When we find ourselves caught up in the chaos of what is happening in the world today and are able to at least recognize, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing. Aside from deep breathing and exhaling, do you have another process to rise above the despair? Okay. Awareness is the key and I set that intention every morning. I ask my guides, please help me to be aware and present throughout the day to, to somehow give me the awareness that I've become absorbed in the story. So you can actually all of a sudden catch what I call a snag. Something says, oh, I'm being a bit negative or oh, I'm caught up in the drama and I'm ill at ease. Just that awareness itself allows us the perspective to rise above. And then the tools, of course, that are often in my, like my course, Let Your Spirit Soar, my favorite tool there is just to, when you've taken that momentary pause, say, isn't that interesting? I should have had you both say it with me in unison, right? Because we all <laughs> use this great tool to just come to that place of neutrality. Then you can add in the deep breathing and the and whatever other tools work for you. But it's, um, it's setting a clear intention for your life that I'm no longer going to remain out of balance. This brings up a good point. I've heard that physically it takes 90 seconds for a strong emotion to dissipate after it's gone through your body. So if you're around somebody who says something really nasty and, and you take it on and you sit back or somebody scares you, you're going to feel that lower vibration for a good minute and a half. If you act on it and get drawn into it, you'll extend that. But if you become aware through presence, that intention of being present, you say, this too shall pass and you just stay and you can watch it flow right through you and now you're back in balance. So there you go. Okay. Matthew asks, on the other side, is there a spectrum of love or is it all a pure love? Once again, we're talking multidimensional beings. Until all of us have completely merged back as source, there is a spectrum everything arises from this sea of love across the veil it's far more palpable yet you still have depending on the different realms the one that immediately follows this in our system is the called the astral realm and there are many souls who still enjoy playing out the story the role that they played here in physical form and uh, the more they cling to the story they may not quite be as loving, if you're going to talk relativity, as others, yet they still experience a change. This is why in reading, sometimes I'll see this symbol, and that means I've seen the light, I've felt the love across the veil, and I'm changing. You won't recognize me when you cross and meet me again. So there is still relativity as long as there's duality, but once we get to a place of oneness, it's all just love. Okay. It's I'm sorry, Lynette, but this morning's message is today, as we're recording this, is May 25th, 2020. If you go to dailyway.org and look at May 25th's entry, uh, it's called AWARE, they speak about their, was that today about only being one truth? Yeah. Nobody has one truth or one answer that we discern truth in our hearts, but it's always going to be relative as long as it goes through the filter of the person speaking. The only one truth is I am aware. And so I'm just very aware that these answers today, I love that I'm answering them for you, hopefully from the highest possible place, but I am not claiming this is absolute truth. This is relative truth coming through the filter of the Suzanne story, but trying my best to discern it from Sanaya, and hopefully it's helpful to y'all. Well, it's interesting that that would be your last comment because my next question has to do with that. <laughs> I'm interested in how to better discern what thoughts, images, and sensations come from spirit or are created by me. Or is there a difference since there's only one mind? 
and where do our thoughts originate from? Yeah, just picture, I like to picture an aquarium, like the sea of all consciousness. The whole thing is the oneness. And down at the bottom would be the still water. But uh, if, if you pictured it like an ocean, you'd have waves up at the top. And that's, a, that's the relative to the stillness state. And we in our human nature would be up here where things are, or get a little bit rocky sometimes. And down here is the stillness, but the, we're part of all of that. And so each of us are acting out our little dramas with each other in little tidal pools within this ocean. Uh, so all thought originally arises from the one mind, but it takes on different roles. And here in this earthly realm, boy, do we get caught up in the drama the more we pay attention to the role we're playing and forget who we are as ultimately this one mind, the more the thoughts become conditioned. I'm gonna mix analogies here, but I've been shown, think about your body as like a room and say you're a, a smoke a, in a room full of smoke, that the same thoughts are just constantly in this smoke-filled room until we open the window and let in fresh air or fresh thoughts. Getting back to the ocean analogy, we need to ask ourselves, are these thoughts coming from my little tidal pool or am I expanding my awareness enough to say, I know I'm more than this story, this role I'm playing, May I tap into the highest possible aspect of the one for the answers I seek? Okay, um, Barbara asks, why do we become blinded to who we really are when we incarnate? We don't know the rules of the game we are in. Yes, but we knew what would happen when we came here as souls. And we come in and here you are looking around with you, nothing has any meaning other than I am. And you look and you know you're one with everything. And then mom and dad put a name on you. And after a while you start to say, oh, when I hear that name, that means me. And now we take on an identity. Then mom and dad teach you things and you start to have experiences and you, you, Sometimes perhaps as a little baby, you touch a hot stove and that hurt and that, that colors your experience and you find out the world isn't so safe and you start focusing on the outer world and now you're forgetting what's really beneath all of these experiences, all of this conditioning. So truly what happens is we don't necessarily forget the soul always is here and knows who we are but it becomes obscured by the focus which is on the outer world instead of the inner world and at some point in your life many times through a tragedy we're so desperate to get back to this place of balance and peace that's always right here we start asking the questions the soul answers and what it's saying through a longing is turn within. I talk about this being the outward object focus. That's O-O-F, I like acronyms. The outward object focus, the outer world often cause, causes us to say, oof, that's the O-O-F. But if we just turn inward and discover what, what is always already here, that's A-A-H. Ah. So if you're feeling a little oof, just remember to turn inward. Take the deep breath. Do the journey of consciousness meditation. Sink beneath the waves and before you even had a name. And ah, peace is right here. I love that. Oof versus ah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, our next question is from Patricia, and this is short and sweet. What truly is the point of all of this? You won't, a lot of you won't like the answer, but I've been having conversations with, source told me to call it joy, conversations with joy every morning. And I'll often sit down and I hear the song, I'm here for the party. And 
anybody who's going through any kind of tragedy now, any suffering would just kick back at that, push back at that. I've had my days when I am saying, this is no party. But what Joy is really saying is, ultimately the ocean cannot be affected by the waves. They arise from the ocean for the experience of it. Source wanted to experience life in all of its fullness through you. What an honor, the odds of you being in this perfect body that has its imperfections at this moment is a miracle. So you get to experience the ups, the downs, the sideways, all of it. Not all parties are fun, but they're so full of experiences and so full of opportunities. And when we come into alignment with source, when we are love in expression, it feels so good. That's what we want more of. So that points right to our true nature. So we came for the experience of all of it. But with this connection, this direct connection home, which is our true nature, that even in the midst of the worst that the human life has to offer us, there's a knowing all is well. That's beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Uh, Andrea asks, I'd love to hear some tips on how not to absorb others' fearful negative energy right now. Okay. I think you can see it right over my shoulder back here. You see this gold thing? That's a beautiful statue of Shiva Nataraja, a Hindu goddess. I don't subscribe to any one religion, but I love the metaphors throughout all cultures that point us in a direction that helps us. And this is a beautiful visual of us with a ring of fire around us. And that fire is really, to me, represents the light of our aura, not just a ring like this, but in a sphere around us. We are this light. And the more we shine it outward, the brighter our light. But at the edge is just this light that will burn off anything that doesn't help us as it comes into our field. This is going to be, sound a little funny, but I picture it like a little bug zapper. So when I get around anybody that's radiating something that I know is not beneficial to me, I just turn up the light and I hear this little zzz, zzz, as their energy can't quite get into my field, but the love can get through. Lower vibrations are zapped by the light. So again, these are all metaphors. If it works for you, give it a try. Perfect. Okay. The next question is from Daryl. What determines who will drop in in a reading? The, when the intention in a reading is that the greatest good be served, then it's going to be what higher consciousness knows will help not only the sitter or the client, but those spirits across the veil. It's all one collective field during a reading. Sometimes it helps the medium as well and all benefit. So it's very good to have an intention as a sitter that I want to hear from a certain loved one with whom I want closure. And hopefully that will happen. But if there is an overarching intention from spirit, that is what is going to take precedence. Let me just add to that. It's always what is going to raise the vibration of the whole. And what is the highest vibration? I know all of you listening know. Love. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, Irene asks a, a specific question, but I know it applies to, to everyone who is grieving. Um, she said, my son died by suicide this January. It happened when I was at work. And I was talking about him with co-workers. I felt a warmth in my heart and a burst of pure love. Mm -hmm. I found out later that he had passed. How can I have that contact with Curtis again? I've tried so hard, but my grief has been very hard. And my heart goes out to all of you dealing with the passing. And I know so many who are dealing with death by suicide. 
Bev, I just went completely blank there as I just was enveloped in love. Read the, read the last question again. How can I have the connection again? Is that it? How can I, I've tried so hard, but how can I have that contact again? Right. It's beautiful how when one is not grieving, they often, before the grief comes, they feel that presence when someone passes. It's that reassurance. You can't not remember that realness of that presence to say that all is well. So we hold in our heart that awareness that my loved one is fine and that grief is part of this human journey. And to know that your loved one is, is standing by waiting to connect with you as you heal. So because energy is so important, grief is like a blanket over our awareness. And so we become loving to ourselves, compassionate to ourselves, understanding that this is something that we go through, be patient, but set the intention that knowing that my loved one is okay, I'm working on disidentifying with the story, remembering that I am a soul and I'll meet you soul to soul as soon as I've cleared out this human stuff. That's good advice. Our next question is from Sarah. When we pass to the other side, if we come back for another journey, does our energy still remain in the spirit world as we also journey into the next life on earth? For example, are we doing it all in this moment? I would recommend you look at a video that we recently put on YouTube about reincarnation and the soul, because that part of us that lived the life here is just one aspect of the soul. And it goes back and joins with the greater soul to bring more wholeness to the soul. The soul is always whole. Everything is already one, but the soul fragments itself like rays of the sun for those various experiences. Can't have it all at once, so we go off on these little journeys. And as each incarnation is completed and feeds the soul with those experiences, that persona, that pattern, the soul can always recreate that. For example, to meet you when you cross the veil, your loved ones will be there because they're still an eternal part of their greater soul. But ultimately, my guides have told me everything is unfolding only here and now, like a heartbeat. Have the experience, bring back the information. Have the experience, bring back the information. But one of the rules of wor our world and the earthly plane is that these experiences play out in what we are, know as time. So that will boggle the mind if we get into this too deeply. But I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Um, Deborah asks, is there something a sitter can do uh, to aid the medium in a reading. Absolutely. Because it's all energy and the sitter is as much a part of that collective field of the reading, that being the medium, the sitter, and all of the sitter's loved ones in the spirit world, and everybody's guides. The sitter focuses on love and gratitude. Those two energies bring a sense of coherence, bring resonance to the whole collective field. And you can feel that if the sitter goes back into grief, the whole energy of the field goes down a bit and then the medium can turn up the love to counterbalance that. So the best thing a sitter can do is just focus on what they are grateful for, be aware of their thoughts and what they're radiating and just turn up the light. That happens. That's great advice for any situation, not just in a reading. That's a good one. This is from Catherine. It seems the words keep me from stepping away from my thinking mind. What can I do about that? Words keep her from stepping away from the thinking mind. Actually, words keep us in the thinking mind. What we need to do to tap into higher consciousness and to find peace is to move our awareness from the thinking mind where we give meaning through words, sink down into the heart and set the intention of knowing. You can practice this in meditation. 
set words aside and ask spirit, what do I need to know? And spirit, the more you work at this, will give you everything in what I call a burst download, one whole knowing without words, and you know the answer. Then the mind will unravel that into words. But we have multiple ways of learning and being, and it doesn't have to be with words. So if you catch yourself thinking, analyzing, questioning, just sink down it's like if you had a gear shift thinking is in forward gear shift into neutral and coast and then say what do i know you don't even need the words it's just an intention and see how that works let's see um let's see janice asks do you ever get messages from someone still living, from their higher self or their soul? This has happened. It doesn't happen too often, but the vast majority of those cases, the person is currently suffering from dementia. I shouldn't use the word suffering because the soul is not suffering, experiencing. The, the human body is experiencing dementia and the soul is so fine, it wants to communicate and let the loved one know that. So it's really magical when that happens. The interesting thing is, it's very challenging to tell that the person, the spirit is not out of the physical body because a medium is connecting soul to soul. So it feels the same, the soul feels the same. And then and that's how I know that it's somebody who's still here. My sitter will say, well, everything you're telling me is my dad. And I'll tune in, I'll say, oh, but he has dementia. You're right. Well, he wants to let you know. He may look like he, he's uh, angry or he's uh, not himself or he can't speak right now, but he's telling me right now he wants you to know he's grateful for the help you're giving him and he's just fine. He's already playing across the veil. Those are beautiful moments. Okay, our next question is from someone who preferred to remain anonymous. Suzanne, how do you clear your energy as an empath? I am a psychic since childhood and my mediumship abilities opened up two years ago. I enjoy what I do, but is there such a thing as psychic protection? Well, we already talked about the seeing the ring of fire around us. There's so many techniques and they're all metaphors that really just take our intention to remain clear and give it a story. So another one is you could set up mirrors all around you facing outward. So it reflects away any energy that doesn't serve you. But again, the love gets through. You could picture your aura like a pink bubble that only loving energy gets through. These all work because it's the intention behind them that I am protected. The thing is we are innately protected when we realize I am the light that just amplifies that. The other thing that's so important is to regularly clear your energy centers, your energetic field. On my website under free meditation gifts is the 10 minute transformation, a 10 minute chakra clearing exercise. When I get off balance, I do it myself. I turn it on on my recorder and go through the whole thing. Just once you're clear, you can just have a nice little quick dusting off of the energy centers. I jokingly refer to one method I use as the roto rooter method of chakra clearing. If I just need a dusting up, I picture myself in a shaft of white light and this spiral of cleansing light comes up and just roots out anything within my energy field that doesn't serve me and out it goes. You can also picture a giant vacuum cleaner coming from above and just sucking out any energy that doesn't work. I mean, these are humorous, but spirit tells us humor is wonderful for raising our vibration. So, so many tools, but whatever works for you, use it. Okay, thank you. Okay, a uh, question from Cindy. I've noticed that my son, who is on the other side, is often very present and sends frequent signs. Other times he is very quiet, often for a week or more. Do spirits have a limited amount of energy to expend at any given time? Oh, what a great question. And my friend Brenda, here you are for the first time. <laughs> She's showing me that just like here, we get distracted by things and we get focused on things. 
she's showing me my little puppy right now who, who once she gets her mind set on something, she goes off in that direction and you can't distract her. So it's not so much energy as intention and attention. She says that's the same even across the veil because we all share that one same mind. So those across the veil, get their attention on something and perhaps it's learning something but then they'll pick up on oh mom or dad or my sister are thinking about me now and their attention is drawn to you like a doorbell going off and brenda's going ding 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 she says people are calling her all the time but she shows me like <laughs> rays of light going out that she can follow all those rays multiple rays the higher one's vibration the more across the veil she says, we can disperse our attention. But she says, don't let them take it personally when they're not hanging out with you all the time. They're busy, they're learning, they're growing, but also don't feel that you're keeping them from anything. They love when you love them. Nice. Beautiful. That's lovely. This one is short and sweet. It's from Ia. How important are colors to us? Color is vibration. Color is equivalent to sound, just a different way of being processed within the body. So some people will use color as tools. They're telling me that it's very uh, useful as a tool in what you wear. I deliberately was told to wear white today. It's just a nice pure color. But if you want to be energized, you could wear red or orange and feel more vitality. So. The guides are saying, pay attention to what colors surround you. They're showing me now hospital waiting rooms that are painted a soft blue are peaceful to those sitting in there. They've found that in schools with hyperactive children, if they change the wall color, you'll have different behaviors. So color is very important. Great. Um, Heather asks uh, a basic question. Um, based on your description of joy during the mentoring session. So is joy the same as spirit and also the same as love? The way I'm using it, yes. I'm using joy with a capital J as a name. And so right away we're limiting that which has no name. So please understand when I say conversations with joy, that's the highest aspect of consciousness that I'm able to tap into at this time, yet still not the fullness. Because as we were just told in one of the Daily Way messages earlier, it, oh, it was yesterday, that if we could feel the fullness of that light that we're really a part of, that we're really expressing, the body would just dissolve as if struck by lightning. And so I call it joy because ultimately, even if I'm not experiencing joy, I know that I'm here because joy wanted to express itself through me. And that gives me hope that even in the midst of any tumult, that joy is always here. So for me, it's just a fitting name, but you could call it God or source or being or nothing at all. It simply is. Okay. This next question is from Paula. Do your guides tell you what is going to happen with the coronavirus and how we are going to be once it's done, if it's ever done? The guides tell me we will be changed forever because we will remember this time and they're telling me that it is a great lesson in fear and freedom and what happens when one's freedom is taken away by human thinking. Yes, it will end because all things pass, all things go through cycles, but you as a collective group are determining the outcome of this. It definitely is causing a shift in consciousness, but it is also showing us the consequences of our choices. And is it not a rare and great opportunity? Please understand that all those who passed are fine. And a special message for those who could not be with loved ones when they passed, please know that this moment did not define their lives and that the moment they crossed, they were met with so much love that any discomfort was immediately erased and they wish only the same for you. 
that you understand they are well and well looked after and that part of your path now is to find peace with the drama and join them, meet them where they are soul to soul without having to leave the body. Mm. Wow, okay. thank you. Um, Sarah asks, um, humanity, as humanity moves forward to a higher resonance, has this gained momentum recently? And are we near reaching the point where those with a higher light and vibration will outweigh the souls with lower vibrations? They show me an exponential rise, but we're not yet at the tipping point. We have crossed the point where there are more awakened people than not awakened yet that have not yet all integrated that into their being. They're telling us to have great patience, but to understand they're showing us the next generation will have far more people who know who they are and who realize that we must work together instead of focusing so much on the self. So there's definitely hope for humanity. Oh, excellent. That's good news. Uh, this next question is from Irene. I had an experience in which I left my body and then returned. Can you talk about what or where I went? <laughs> we leave our bodies each night in awareness when we sleep. And we're actually playing with our soul groups across the veil and learning and trading information that we, we uh, receive during the day. What and where you go is just to greater expanded states of yourself. We really don't leave the body because we're not permanently in the body. As souls, we are everywhere at once. We simply identify with the body when we keep that outward object focus. So the term out of body experience is a bit of a misnomer. It's really a shifting of attention to beyond the body. Okay, um, this is a, a mediumship question from Leslie. I don't always get the deceased person's name or how they died. Sometimes it takes me a while to get something that I can verify or the sitter can verify. Uh, I'm a bit discouraged. Uh, how I would appreciate any advice on, on how to move to being able to get more evidential information. Well, I'll, have, I'll let you know that I uh, don't get names that often. I almost always do discern how they pass, but I just noticed I did a reading the other day and I said, wow, they never even showed me how they passed. And I certainly didn't get a name yet. There was no doubt in the sitter's mind, this is my loved one. So as I try to emphasize, it's really wonderful to get specific evidence, but not to the fact that it cuts off our overall connection. So. I would say don't try at all to get the evidence. Trying is counterproductive. Get yourself out of the way, set a clear intention, and just become one with that spirit so that as you speak, you are absolutely showing their essence. And hopefully it'll all come together as you grow as a medium. Great. Okay. Our next question is from Jackie. She wants to thank you for your loving service to the world. And also wants to know if you have any thoughts on the soul phone. First of all, we're all in loving service to this world and we wouldn't pay paying attention to this right now. Just by being present here, hopefully all of us feel the love that's coming from our teams that brought us here together and you're going to be sending out ripples to the world where you go. So I thank all of you for the time you're putting into listening to this. Uh, the question was about any information on the soul phone. Yes. I don't have any new information, but you can actually Google soul, soul phone and look that up. <laughs> okay. Um, this is from Lavinia. Um, she says, I can feel when someone is dying, but I never know who it is. I would like to know how I can help those spirits that are, I think are trying so hard to connect to me, but I don't know what they want at that moment. I normally find out that someone I know uh, has died, but it, do I have to help them cross over? Is, is this a calling for help from me? It feels as if you are 
very empathic, that those across the veil see your light and know that you will be able to sense them somehow. So I would just keep in mind that you can have two-way communication when you feel this. Open up the awareness that because they're in your awareness, you can actually say, who is this? And if you don't, even if you don't sense something, what is your message? Why are you in my awareness now? And hopefully discern something so that when you do learn of their passing, you'll have that message ready for them. But again, it all comes back to setting the intention to open up more to this and then making it more interactive. Where is the best place? Uh, sorry, this is from Suzanne. Where is the best place to start with connecting across the veil with your spirit guides or with a close friend or relative that has transitioned? Okay, that's a different Suzanne than me. I didn't ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> and the best place is going to be unique for each one of you. So just set the intention of connecting with some aspect of higher consciousness, whatever will serve the highest good and your advancement in connecting across the veil. Because often, even when we set our own goals, I want to connect with my own child who's passed, or my mom or my dad, we're limiting ourselves. That may come as a result of getting another connection, perhaps with the guides first. So nothing wrong with setting a specific goal, but also set the goal, may the greatest good be served by my connecting right here, right now. And then just flow with it. The more we learn to get out of the way and be good with whatever happens and have those adventures in consciousness, that's when the beautiful miracles flow. Great. All right. So I'm going to bring us back into gallery view now. So we have all three of us on the screen. I'm so grateful to both of you. Lynette and Bev for asking the questions. I'm thankful to everybody that asked the questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but I feel that that was enough to give a flavor for how this works. And what I really encourage all of you to do is get to know your guides, ask questions in meditation, and see what insights you get. Always go into the heart and discern how that felt. And I know that Bev and Lynette would have answered so many of those questions just the way I did. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you uh, anytime you want to join us for the monthly mentoring, but most of all, just go out and shine your light on everyone around you. We're so glad you're part of this community with us. So, thank you, Suzanne. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.